Good afternoon. I'm going to present two ideas fairly quickly that will explain why I'm in this room. One, we're all students. I don't mean that in a ridiculously trivial way or a condescending platitude that suggests that uh, those people between kindergarten and college are uh, second-class citizens or uh, not ready for the real world, some way of um, keeping them either in their place or, um, or marginalizing them. I mean it in a revolutionary way. I mean it in the sense that unless we're all students, we're not going to make it to the 22nd century. That unless we're all students, the problems of the world that have grown to such a level of complexity and extent and danger that unless we're all in on making the world a better place and helping to solve the problems, we're not going to make it. That's one. Number two of the two ideas that I want to present to explain why I'm in this room. We as a species, global humanity, the greatest challenge facing us is how to get us in the know, meaning knowledgeable about the state of the world, our technology, our resources, our problems, and our options in as quick a time as possible. We're students, and that's the challenge. Why? As H.G. Wells succinctly summarized, we're in a race between education and catastrophe. It had, given those two facts, we need to look at the task at hand we need to look at our function in the world, in the universe, us folks as, as beings on this planet, as that of not only of students, but that the school system, the curriculum, and in fact the world needs to be organized in such a way that we learn about not just saving the world. That's the trivial part. There are indeed things that need to be saved. There's also things that need to be stopped. But the bulk of the things that need to happen to make sure we make it are things that need to be built. We need to learn the present so we can invent the future. We need to figure out where we are, where we're going, where we want to be going, what's needed, and how to make it possible so that what we see and dream, we can make it real. So what I want to do right now to further this narrative is, is to present an alternative story on how you got into this room. To do that, I need you to... Uh, uh, what, suspend disbelief for just a few moments, and I'm going to explain that um, this morning you were sound asleep. You were woken up by some knocking on the door. It was not frantic pounding like uh, the house is on fire, get out, or some maniacs at the door trying to get in and do some harm. It was just a knock, knock, knock. You crawl out of bed, you get to the door, you look through the window, and this guy shows up, which sort of takes you aback. Somebody like this has never shown up at your door before, much less at the crack of dawn. Nevertheless, he doesn't look threatening. He's just standing there. He's, you know, okay, I'll open the door. You open the door, and he does something quite surprising. No, and it's, it's not leaping in and grabbing you, throwing you to the ground, handcuffing you and dragging you out. He addresses you by your name. He says, uh, good morning, uh, Miss Corrin, or Mr. Johnson, or, or Samantha. Or he addresses you by your personal name. And he says, um, we need you to come with us right away. And... When he says we, you look around and uh, standing next to him are these guys. Again, you, for some strange reason, you don't feel threatened because they are not threatening. They're standing there fairly respectively. And in fact, they say, please, could you please come with us? There's an emergency, but, but put your shoes on first. You're going to need them. And so you proceed to leave your house with these folks. You walk down from your front door to a street where um, you are confronted by a, 
a whole bunch of these guys, you know, on your side of the street, on the other side of the street, on the rooftops. And right before you get into the middle of three black SUVs with black windows, uh, you notice that there's two helicopters at both ends of the street you live on just hoovering there. You get into that vehicle and you are uh, whizzed through the streets um, to something that looks remarkably like this room. You uh, look around this room and, and there are people sitting in the room that look fairly similar to the ones who are sitting in next to you and front and back of you. And um, the first thing that happens is um, after you wait a little bit of time, a civilian shows up in front of the room and uh, first of all starts off by apologizing to you in the, for the rapid way you were brought into this room and, uh, and tells you that, um, look, we're, we're sort of sorry, but um, there is this emergency and uh, you have been brought into this room because uh, you have been part of a training program for many years, unbeknownst to you. The training program started the day you were born. And you have been trained to take over a fairly large craft, a very, very large spacecraft. You are to be the captains of the spacecraft and something very drastic has happened. It has just happened, you know, about 10 hours ago. It was so bad that we decided we had to terminate your training program and bring you in here because you are the captains, the new captains who have been trained to deal with these kind of emergencies and um, we need you. There's some things though that you need to know about this emergency. Um, and we're not proud to admit this, but we don't know where we are. Um, where we're going. We don't even know what the emergency is, but there's enough bells, uh, alarms going off that we know this is critical. And oh, by the way, the survival of the spacecraft is at stake, which by implication means your survival is at stake as well. Um, but just to make things a little bit uh, uh, better, you know, it is a race between education and catastrophe, not a uh, massacre. Uh, there is another room beneath here and some more rooms above us that looks like this. There are hundreds, almost um, close to a thousand people who are there uh, organized to answer any question you might have about uh, the, the, this giant spacecraft so that you're more informed and can make uh, an intelligent decision that is going to determine your survival and that of the spacecraft. So um, all of these folks are gathered together to uh, answer your questions. And so I've done this particular exercise with over 150,000 people. And uh, usually what they start off asking are things like this, you know, what is the problem? You know, how many people are impacted? What are the options? How much time do we have? Is the place on fire and we gotta, you know, put the fire out or what? Uh, they'll also eventually wanna know where are we and what the heck is the situation? Who made us captains? Is there a rescue ship? How do I get out of here? Um, is there an operating manual? A few other things like that. Where are we going and where do we want to be going? Where do we want to be going? Turns out to be the key question. Uh, where we want to be going is not often the same as where we happen to be going. And um, so where do we want to be going? You know, unless we change our direction, we're going to end up where we're heading. Where we want to be heading is critical to all the other uh, decisions we want to be making. And so taking this um, question further, uh, what do you want the world, make, honing it down, making it more specific, you know, what do you want the world to be like? And more specifically, what do you want it to be like in 10 years time? Uh, and then also more specifically, whatever it is, we want it done in positive terms. So instead of saying, well, in 2025, 10 years, there's nobody hungry on the planet or there's no war. So instead of saying those things in negative terms, you say it positively like, Instead of no hunger, everybody's well fed. Or instead of there's no war, there's peace on earth. It's, we're interested in what you're for, not what you're against. All right, so moving rapidly along, 
over 150,000 people answered that question, and they've come up with things like this. You know, abundant food, clean, safe, affordable food, water, housing, energy, clean environment, all of the sort of wonderful things that you might identify as desirable, they all boil down to these three major categories. Everybody out there for, want for everybody on the planet the basic human needs, you know, food and water, healthcare, education, shelter, uh, for everybody, 100% of humanity, basic human rights fulfilled, and the environment, we ought not to destroy it while we're doing that. Those are the three major categories. And so the um, real key question here, is this an off-the-wall fantasy by a bunch of wild-eyed radicals at a TEDx talk in, at the George School, or, or what? Because um, if it is an off-the-wall fantasy, we might as well just go home. So I want to ask you the, a question. Who thinks that that vision of the future, meeting the basic human needs, fulfilling all the basic human rights, not destroying the environment in the process, how many think that's possible? Raise your hand. Some of you. All right, how many of you think it's possible using present-day technology and known resources to pull that off? A few, less than before. How many of you think it's possible using present-day technology, known resources, and that's affordable? Still, okay. There's still a few of you. Well, congratulations. <laughs> I'm uh, going to present this slide is the product of 15 years of research. And it took, as the formulation, the start of the research project, is it possible to meet the basic human needs, the food and the energy, the health care, shelter, water, sanitation, et cetera, for everybody in the world? How would you do it? What's the technology? How much resources does it take? And how much would it cost? And what came up were some rather staggering large costs um, to give you an idea of how large the costs are, uh, the amount we needed to get rid of smallpox on this planet was that little square in the bottom, about $300 million. The other costs are obviously in the billion dollar range. But in order, oh, another part of this, these are yearly figures, not total, so they're yearly figures for like 10 years, so that, that eliminates starvation and malnutrition 20 billion per year. But if you look at it, trying to put these numbers in some larger context, um, this is what it looks like. The United States alone spends 40 billion per year on dieting, taking off excess weight. If you look at what, to provide clean, safe water, that's six months of what we spend on video games. Eliminate illiteracy, uh, that's six months of what just US teenagers spend. Healthcare, two months of what the US spends on alcohol and tobacco. This is not a diatribe against alcohol, tobacco, video games, or anything else. It's just trying to point out that these staggeringly large numbers aren't quite as large as we thought when uh, compared to some of the things we're also spending money on. Moving that along, the, you know, the, what filled up the screen before is now on the lower right-hand side of that larger chart, which is annual military expenditures. So less than for 25% of what we spend annually on the military around the planet, um, we could meet the basic human needs of everybody, fulfill the basic human rights, and clean up the environment at the same time. In other words, the vision of making the world work for everybody might not just be as, might not be an off-the-wall fantasy by a bunch of wild-eyed radicals. Uh, to put it in yet another context, the U.S. could afford to do it itself. It would be less than half of the U.S. expenditures on the military. Uh, by the way, just this is a study that came out three weeks ago. The IMF, International Monetary Fund, just came out with a study that pointed out that the annual, annual subsidies to the fossil fuel industry are $6.4 trillion. Uh, this is, you know, the annual military expenditures are only, you know, less than two. So the punchline here is, is that it's affordable. Um, so here's the uh, good news, the bad news on all of this. Um, the good news, the world can be made to work for everyone. 
with present-day technology and known resources, I'll contend at standards higher than anyone currently enjoys at a cost that is easily affordable. The bad news is it's not going to happen. Uh, if it was going to happen, it would, would have happened. Um, it's not going to happen uh, unless, and uh, unless you get involved, you make it happen, you use the training that you've had, been undergoing since you were born on this planet, the training that makes you a unique contributor to the problems of the world, the problems now that are so complex, so dangerous, so pervasive that um, the leaders of the world, the elected officials, the experts don't have a chance of solving them, if they ever did. That it, now those problems need all of us, need us to not just uh, see it as our uh, prerogative to get involved in doing something out there, but it's also our responsibility. A, B, and C, that we have a license to do it, a mandate to do it, and that without us getting involved, we're not going to make it to that 21st, 22nd century, possibly not even to 2050, when the youth of the world, the folks that are in this school, are going to be 50, 40, 50, 60 years old, where they're going to be in charge. So we want to create the world that we want. You know, we want to have the future of education not just be something that happens in schools like this, but happens throughout society, throughout the world. How did you get into this room? Real question is, what are you going to do now? Thank you.